so if any of you, as it says, recording in progress. So if any of you have any privacy concerns, please feel free to keep your videos off. Uh, but otherwise, of course, it's uh, very nice for us uh, that our speaker can see you and interact with you. We all pin the screen on the speaker, so mostly their video, which is getting recorded. Um, so with a short introduction, Present Spirit is an independent project that was started by me. I am Tejal. I'm based in um, India, in Himachal Pradesh right now. And uh, I started this project last year during lockdown, um, mostly with the aim that the Buddhist teachings on non-duality, on wisdom and compassion could be brought to very contemporary audiences with an intersection, uh, looking at how it intersects with queer feminism, uh, with ecological concerns, with disability studies, with art and with science. So to take that uh, forward, today uh, we have our very special guest, Piali Banerjee, um, who is going to be doing for us an artist presentation, looking at how art intersects with activism, with dharma. So just a few words to introduce Piali to all of you. Piali is a Bay Area-based South Asian artist, activist, advocate, survivor, and mother. She uses art as a means to bring awareness to social justice issues, speaking to the experience of individuals in terms of race and ethnicity, gender, sexuality, geographic location, socioeconomic status, age, and religion. Her mediums include large murals, body painting, and drawing of portraits. So uh, with that, Piali is going to share with us several of her artistic projects, her social justice projects, and very much more about her life. This will be an interactive presentation, so we look forward to your feedback and comments. And just a note to say, that some of the images um, are explicit or include nudity. So um, just to state that. And with that, I uh, hand over uh, the mic, so to speak, to Piali. Welcome, Piali. Thank you so much for doing this for Sisters and Spirit and for everybody who's here. Thank you so much, Tejal, and it's so wonderful to see so many familiar faces and new faces. I, I'm really so grateful that um, you all are here. And thank you so much to the Sisters in Spirit, Tejal. This is such an amazing opportunity for me to really reflect on this intersection and um, uh, and and just really think about why I'm doing what I'm doing. So. Um, Thank you. Um, so yeah, I before I start and really show some of the artwork um, from my various projects, I just wanted to speak a little bit about my journey and how I have used, how I found a way to use art in order to integrate issues of social justice, which I'm very passionate about. And I have really taken this on my Buddhist, uh, on the path, my Buddhist path, and um, integrated that also with my Buddhist studies. So for me, a commitment to Buddhist principles entails the active and earnest engagement in com contemporary issues, which involved, as we can see from last year, equity, as well as social justice, um, environmental justice and so on. There's just a lot that has happened in the past year. And um, based on a lot of the teachings I have been attending, as well as just my own studies in um, Buddhist philosophy, what I learned was that the Buddha, Gautama Siddhartha, was the most earnest and enthusiastic activist or advocate of his time. He left his kingdom <clears throat> Um, when he had everything, um, he left the compounds of, of his, um, his palace in order to stand up against what was 
what was right or wrong and he pointed out what what was wrong so in 2700 years ago um he stood up he was an activist against sexism casteism racism and so on he didn't really want to go along with the status quo or the norms if he thought that they were wrong and as a matter of fact he also pointed them out um so when i first joined or you know started walking the path of the buddha dharma i used to feel that buddhism and activism were two extremely separate things however through studying buddha's philosophy as well as hearing stories of the buddha's life i saw that he was an activist the bodhisattva is an activist and um they really show a very beautiful way of carrying this very important work out i'm not an expert on this um or art or even um meditation or philosophy however um i am learning and i'm i'm so happy to share my process today um so yeah before i get started i wanted to speak a little bit to art in general and what my path and process has been over the course of the the last few years um so to me art can be many things it can be beautiful it can be thought provoking um it can tell stories it could be immersive um so all my life i've really doodled in textbooks when i should have been paying attention in class i've drawn on my arms i've covered my legs in art and paint i've drawn painted on walls i shouldn't have um i've also done a lot of street art so uh that was vandalism in some way but to me it was beautifying um my neighborhood um so I feel like creativity in the arts is a profound way for the artist to give expression to a commitment or you know in my case social justice issues and really instill instill um or encourage others to reflect on what is just what is right and I really like people to come up with their own um insight and opinion so my art really speaks to that um and then we uh, i'm going to speak a little bit about my story but before i go into that also i wanted to just share that my own personal story has really made me interest in social justice it's a vow i have taken um i i really love creating art for beauty and pleasure but for me i feel as though it's most meaningful when i um give people a voice or um speak to a crisis or the urgent need for change um so yeah um so yeah i'm piali i'm a south asian american my pronouns are she her um i have mainly lived uh between india and the united states i think at this point it's almost like 50-50 or maybe more in the states but most of my childhood was spent in india um and then as tejal said i'm a mother i'm a data analyst i'm a sister i'm a buddhist a meditator an artist and um i hold a lot of these various labels and and master titles master status but that's not as important um so yeah i was born in the us and then i moved to india with my family when i was quite young i'm very grateful to say that we lived a very comfortable life um i didn't really have an idea of the suffering or challenges in my community as a child i'm sure things are changing now and um in india but i i didn't really see any of like the gender roles that were playing out in society i also grew up with a lot of mixed messages um through you know bollywood hollywood where there was um it was quite different from the conservative life i lived at home um and then we also didn't really speak about a lot of issues in my family it's not their fault i just you know i i was expected to to focus on my education so um 
when I did see or hear about the Kargil war, that was a war between India and Pakistan, um, I, it, it took me by surprise that these things were even happening in my community or my nation or country or the world. Um, and so, yeah, moving to the US was um, a major adjustment. It was a culture shock. Um, and I moved to the middle of nowhere in Ohio. Um, I knew very little about American history and actually everything I had been taught was from a colonial perspective. Um, and as a matter of fact, even the history I was taught in India kind of wore a hazy version of that lens as well. Um, and so very soon after I moved to the US, I experienced a very traumatic um, experience, which really then molded the rest of my life. And um, it was, it was a, a, a violent act against my body. And it really made me ponder a lot of really important questions that then took me on a path to inquiry and to just really know more about myself. So um, while this was a really painful experience, I also got to think about really important questions such as what my role was as a woman in this world or how do I exist as an emotional or sexual creature? I thought about safety. Um, I also reflected on the freedom of expressing myself as a woman, as a girl. I thought a lot about why I was born into my particular family. Um, and I just wanted to know what life was. If we wake up, do all these various things, go to sleep, rinse and repeat, what does this mean and how can I make meaning of it? So after this uh, traumatic experience, I mean, of course I got a lot of help and support I really did fall, sink into a place of victimhood for a couple of weeks, you know, thinking, why me? However, um, after a while, I, I found a need to transform and to really harness strength. And I also realized that my story was shared by so many women, girls, children, and even boys and men. And I realized what happened to me was not unique, but my strength and courage could be unique. So this really shaped the way I utilized art. Um, and as you can see, my art really was born from suffering in some way or an inquiry of life and just really to feel myself more to, to understand who I was and um, why we were here. Um, so while, so we're gonna go into one of my art projects called the Sacred Labyrinth. Um, but this, this project where I painted women or female identifying people was really to explore the idea of um, being, a, a, a being a female identifying person um, and also just exploring um, my, my body and also the, the notions of a survivor. And so while this, our bodies are a place for, for birth, for pleasure, for action, I also noticed that it was a place for you know, it could be a site for violence. And, and so this, my artistic journey was a, was a journey that really moved from victimhood to really living my life in order to bring change, give voice, and really moving past being a survivor also. And this is the reality of so many women and it shows up in many ways if it wasn't just rape or sexual assault. It could be um, uh, having someone um, Eve's call or, you know, it, it shows up at work. But in general, this really just creates a very challenging atmosphere for a lot of girls and women. So I share all of this because this really shaped my, um, my, my social justice world as well as my... Um, 
my eager participation in the Buddha Dharma. Um, and lastly, the, the this my art, my artistic process, as well as my practice in meditation and Buddha Dharma really changed my framework. It changed my narrative. And I'm really grateful for that. I know for some people, this takes a long time. Um, but for me, it really, my narrative in my mind changed from why this happened to me, to how this happened for me, which is really important and it's really reframed everything in my life um so uh, since then i have engaged <clears throat> um <clears throat> excuse me um wh while i was in grad school i and even in college and university till now i feel like there are little ways that i really felt called to participate either through volunteering work or actually just studying or working, um, you know, professionally in ways that I could give voice, uh, give a voice or uplift marginalized groups of people. So I did this through working in poll booths. I volunteered at the crisis center. Um, I've given talks about sexual violence. So my entire life in general was geared towards policies that, um, give voice or uh, provide services to young girls and, and um, women. Um, so, and, and then when I moved to New York City, I started doing graffiti and street art. And um, for me, that was a form of social justice. I often depicted um, pregnant women and birthing woman, which is something quite different from what um, most street artists depict women. So it was just important for me to um, paint phases of, of a woman's life or a fe female identifying person's life where um, you know they were carrying life. And um, through my own experience um, with sexual violence, I noticed that this wasn't, you know, this was something that could have been taken away from even me. So um, street art was a huge part of me bringing out my artwork into the world and into the community and working with other girls and children to do so. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, before I go in, I'd also like to speak a little bit about dharma and how that has really, um, you know, been integrated into my life. Um, so I began to uh, meditate regularly and attend teachings sometime in 2015. Um, at this time in my life, I was working in the anti-human trafficking field. So I did a little bit of work in India, but that was mainly working with um, rescue homes. <clears throat> I worked with law enforcement um, that were uh, doing raids in Calcutta. I then started working in San Francisco as well as New York. And um, I started getting very sick from um, an inherited autoimmune disease, but the flares started increasing the more I started, um, you know, I got more immersed in this job. So I, I didn't really have answers. I wasn't really aware that um, my stress could cause uh, this disease to just get so bad. And it really forced me to investigate my body, my mind. So I left um, the US and I went to India uh, where I was supposed, I was doing an Ayurvedic treatment, and soon I um, decided that I wanted to do a vipassana course. Um, and so this was my quest to understand, I guess, my purpose, which is very, I think, in some ways, a little narcissistic. And so I went in with the intention into a vipassana retreat to learn more about why I was here. And after the course, I, I did accomplish something. However, it's not an, I, I did not get an answer to my question about my purpose. 
However, the gate did open a deeper yearning and curiosity to study the Buddha's teachings. And that quest really took me to um, attend teachings of my one of the teachers I've studied under. And I also went to Dharmsala, where I studied under many teachers. I also did a lot of solitary retreat. And I um, one thing that really stood out, which I'd really love to share here in the space, is that um, I was a part of a lot of small group discussion um, and I remember being the one person in these groups that constantly brought up the question of social justice. And oftentimes my uh, question revolved around how, um, how we in this retreat setting was benefiting if we were all sitting in this complete utopia in the Himalayas when we could be serving others and helping others. And I brought this up multiple times. I probably did with my um, with the teacher as well. And it was really through, you know, really thorough investigation into what I was being taught that I realized that it's not just when you do serve in the soup kitchen or when you are, you know, handing out um, bags to the homeless or, you know, in my case, I was working with um, survivors of human trafficking. It's every action, thought, speech that can result in benefiting others. And it's also just intention. So while I was working in the anti-trafficking world, I wasn't taking care of myself. So I'm not too sure. And I also had a lot of anger inside me. So I'm not too sure how beneficial I was. And maybe I was, but I could be better if I were taking other steps as well. Um, so I, I, I learned that being kind, being helpful, maybe putting, um, calling a loved one, asking them how, they, how they're doing, um, calling a friend, um, asking someone you know who's in pain, how you can be better there for them. And in general, the idea of cultivating bodhicitta, which is so potent. When I first heard this, I was amazed. I didn't realize that this was a medicine um, that could have been helping me because I never I had never heard of anything. And bodhicitta means cherishing others more than yourself. To me, that was so profound, but I didn't know how to do that or cultivate it. So that really made me want to learn study and contemplate deeper so um, yeah i so based on my experience i made a commitment to continue um my practice and then also moving back to the u.s and you know the political climate at the time it was 2017 and um it was, it was quite chaotic here. So I, I decided that I wanted, I was really committed to activism through my art or advocacy and um, finding a more peaceful way of expressing the urgency for change in our community. I wanted to do this in a way where I wasn't making others feel defensive, um, but in a way that I could share um, my thoughts, the thoughts of other people, um, and just really the urgency in order to bring change to our community. So um, yeah, I want to just go back to the goal of this uh, presentation. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think that the main intersection that I see um, of the Buddha Dharma and utilizing art in a way to um, uh, do work in social justice is um, they both for me came from a place of suffering or perhaps a way of wanting to know myself or feel more deeply and freely. And then it actually just came from a place of wanting to feel alive and as present as I can for others. and through the dharma, I have really contemplated how I can be of benefit to others through art. Okay, so maybe we can start.
um, the presentation. Piali, can you can everyone see the screen? Piali, can you see the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you could go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I'm not a fan of reading through slides, so I'm just going to talk, but please feel free to read the slide. Um, also, maybe at the end of this presentation, if you'd like a link to um, this presentation, I'm happy to share that. Um, Tejal can send it out. Um, I don't think we're going to get through all of the various stories just for the sake of time. We only have another half an hour, but um, and we can also I just want to read the room. So if we want to go, you know, more into the stories or more questions, please feel free to stop me. Um, perhaps you can put up your hand and then Tejal can um, let me know that you'd like a question and then, um, yeah, you can ask away. Um, and please, I, I really would love to hear any kind of feedback, even if it's something that's um, uh, <laughs> challenging. So uh, yeah, the first project I'd like to speak about is um, the Sacred Labyrinth Project. So this project um, was a very, very healing experience for me because um, I was the artist and I had um, many different um, individuals that identify as being female um, plus me in order for me to paint them. So I painted their vulvas so it was body painting. And then I had a photographer take a photo of it. But um, in the beginning of this project, I was trying to create beautiful work. But as I started connecting with my participants, I realized that we shared a story, even if it wasn't the details that connected, our, connected us. It was the feelings of, a feeling of, um, not being isolated in our experiences. There was a lot of trauma, um, shameful experiences. And um, what I realized was that the story was shared with everybody. And I've actually painted over 300 individuals and there is a common thread that connects every single person I have painted. Um, and I feel like this is very, um, um, I feel like this is very important and it was very pivotal for me in my own healing since I felt very alone in my experience. I also often felt broken and unseen. So um, yes, this body of work speaks for itself and I like to include the stories for each participant. So in the next upcoming slides, you'll see a photograph, which is the, the picture of the participant and the art that we co-created. And then to the left or to the right, you'll find um, a little write-up that the participant shared. And I also wanted to share that um, the participants have all, all 300 have agreed or, um, to be uh, anonymous. And I did include their birth year because that's something, a consensus that I took that folks really felt comfortable sharing. Um, and in order to make this a little bit more interactive, I'd really like to call upon volunteers to read the stories. So um, can I have someone um, to read this out loud? Maybe you can unmute yourself. And so anybody who would like to volunteer to just read the text, yeah, Tripti, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Hello. Oh, oh go ahead. The butterfly uh, the, has grown. Sorry. Do, do you want to read it, Wayne? Go ahead. Oh, okay. The butterfly lagoon. I lost my virginity to my boyfriend in high school. He told me it would be his first time too. I trusted him. We made love a few times after that, 
and soon I would start breaking out into ruby red blisters. After an embarrassing doctor's visit with my mother, I told my boyfriend I had herpes. The next thing I know, my whole class found out. I hated my vulva. It took me years to embrace its beauty and all its petals and colors. Thank you, Wayne. Okay, yeah, I think we can go to the next slide. Okay. So this is a solar system. There's, um, I don't think I included a story for this one. You can go to the next one, Dejal. Okay, can I get another volunteer to read this? Maybe Tripti, you can read it now this time? Sure, sure. The eye. The vagina to me is cosmic from the perspective of Buddhism, which I practice. Our perception co-creates reality and there's thought to be no division between mind and matter. I've also wondered about the symbolism of how I see the world through my vagina, how it co-creates the world and how I choose to be a creative being. Anonymous, birth year 1975. Thank you so much, Tripti. I think we can go to the next one. Um, so I just want to speak a little bit to the story. It was really long. Um, uh, so this piece is called Over the Hills and Far Away. And this woman had a very traumatic experience. She's currently a professor <clears throat> at Columbia University in New York. And um, this, this place, she wanted me to create the mountains and her happy place in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. So it was, it was very wonderful meeting her multiple times, talking about her vision, and then finally coming up with a way to create it. So not, it's not only the trust that she had, but it was also just, um, you know, working with her collaboratively to create her happy place in order to transform her pain associated with, you know, her traumatic events to um, really come, she, she hangs this up above her fireplace today. And it's no longer a place of pain and trauma. It's something that she's very proud to show all of her friends. It's very bold. I'm not, you know, I don't know how my family would respond to the, this. They're actually attending this talk right now, but it's, um, yeah, it was very beautiful. It really was transforming for me to hear the stories of these participants. I really feel like I got the most out of it because, yeah, they were just incredible. Okay, next. Okay. Can I have another volunteer? Um, I can read it if there's no other candidates. Go for it. Okay. Water, the source of life. I've been engaged in an ongoing process of reclaiming my sexuality and power. And the vulnerability of this project speaks to me because I imagine it will offer further opportunities to examine any shame that I, we as women, have about our intimate and sacred body parts. I have a theater project right now that centers around the labyrinth as a metaphor for the liberation of creativity. I expect that it will bring insight about the ways in which I may feel some shame about my body that I'm not fully aware of. I hope that it will empower me to see my vulva as a place of power and beauty, even more than I already do. I intend to release shame to embrace being seen. I release fear to embrace power. I release judgment to embrace creativity. Anonymous participant, birth year 1987. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Maybe we can move on to the next one. Okay, can we, maybe I can read this. The fish, symbol of woman. 
I have been shamed for having many partners when men get a free pass on doing so. As a matter of fact, it is a sign of being cool or powerful <clears throat> to sleep with many women. There's no, there is so much slut shaming in our culture. I have especially been, been shamed by the Christian side of my family for being on birth control. I found out that the Jesus fish was the pagan sign of woman until the Christians took it. I would like to reclaim it. Next. Can I get another volunteer? I'll read this one. <clears throat> the Eye of Horus. As an Egyptian woman, I feel a strong connection to ancient Egypt. I am Muslim, and there is much stigma of the female body and women's role in the world and household. I have had much resistance from my family to continue with education and not be married off with a primary career in baby making and a caretaker of the house. My vagina makes me strong. It is my guiding eye of my path. Anonymous, birth year, 1973. Um, okay, I can... Um, I can uh, read this clearly for you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Sea creature. I started experiencing my vulva from a young age. The first real memory I have found of it was around five or six. I grew up with a lot of boys in my house and was very confused by my lack of anatomy. I was really interested in why I had to be sitting down unlike my brothers. I used to be ashamed that I had to dress different and was encouraged to play with other toys alone while they banded together. I look at it now at least once a day, most days around five or six times. I'm always checking on what's going on down there, making sure it's still there. My vagina reminds me of a sea creature. I like that it keeps itself lubricated. I can use my legs to grab things and pull it into its mouth, maybe like a fish hiding in some rocks, something very alive and loved. Anonymous, birth year 1991. Thank you, Tejo. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to move along and then I'll stop at specific stories that I'd really like to share. So yeah, maybe we can go to the next one. Um, this is a very powerful piece. I'm so sorry if it's quite a sore to the eyes, but I feel like it's very important. So while I love to make happy and you know beautiful pieces of work, um, I was actually, I met with somebody who um, worked in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as um, Sudan, where they do geni female genital mutilation. And this is a place where they use rape as a form of civil war. So um, yeah, this person actually shared a story not from her experience working there, but I still feel like it's very beautiful and very real for a lot of people. Um, I hold you accountable for the day my boyfriend committed suicide. Did you not see my tears in the darkness? I hold you accountable for getting me as a minor so drunk after our work shift. I hold you accountable for trying to drag me into your car. I hold you accountable for not stopping once my vagina hurt because you weren't done and I wanted it. I hold you accountable for pressing me up against the dance floor too many times. I hold you accountable for touching me at the photo shoot. I hold you accountable for telling me you'd wrestle me naked when I was a kid. I hold you accountable for slapping my ass as a waitress. I hold you accountable for grabbing my arms at the train station. I hold you accountable for pulling at me at the bus stops. I hold you accountable for photographing me in the green rooms. I hold you accountable for stalking me into hallway corners for kisses. 
I hold you accountable for the reasonable sheltered life my mother gave me because of you. She and my family are breaking the cycles of abuse. I hold you accountable. Anonymous, birth year 1991. We can go to the next slide. Okay, can I have a volunteer? I'll I read Nally. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Eve. Okay, my ex-husband. I recently left my Hasidic community. It was a hard journey and integrating into society was terrifying, even though I've lived in New York City all my life. I was not living in New York City, but in a bubble within the city held by strict conservative rules of my community. I married a boy who had a bad reputation, but my parents were convinced things would change, especially since our rabbi strongly urged for this union. The night of consummation, my husband told me to turn over and that he would enter from behind. He gave me a towel to bite into and told me that he had done this before. It hurt for the woman, but I would get over it in a few minutes. That, that not only made me feel sick to my stomach, but I felt like an insect. So my husband put up the bed sheet with the opening. Soon it started and I bit hard into the towel. Every few minutes it would stop and then continue again. I prayed so hard that this would end soon. Suddenly, by accident, the bed sheet fell. I turned around to look directly at my husband and his two friends who had their pants undone. When I told my family, no one supported me. They told me to make it right. I left. Anonymous, birth year 1968. Thank you. Okay, can we have someone to read this? I can read this one. The Crucifix. I am an Ethiopian Christian and came to the US to the Midwest to be exact. I was surprised to see Jesus depicted as a Caucasian, but that was not as shocking as some of their political views and how they impose these views on their congregation. There was a lack of compassion, acceptance, and tolerance, which I found astounding. I know Jesus to be kind and loving to all. He spent a significant amount of time with sex workers, thieves, murderers, giving them love, sharing kind words, and trying to bring change through example. He definitely did not protest outside clinics or brothels, etc. I continue to have a deep connection with God. Anonymous, birth year 1964. Thank you. Can I have someone read this? Hi, Piali. Pick your brain. As a neurosurgeon, I have found much strength as a woman. However, it took me years. I had to build myself up and become financially stable after med school. I worked so hard to find my place in the medical field. I found my sweet spot after years of working hard and trying to prove myself. I won. When I started off in med school, the field was predominantly men with a sprinkle of women. To me, my vulva is a brain, smart, driven, and the container of my mind, a very powerful place. Anonymous, birth year, 1953. Thank you, Shana. Okay, someone else? Um, I can read this one. Um, the spider web. My vagina is a mixed bag of everything. Misconceptions, sadness, love, pleasure, trauma, pain, blood, juice, fullness, smooshness. I also feel as though it holds the feminine energy which forms a web to catch things, which is also known as deep intuition. I feel so deeply and trust my intuition to sense danger, intentions, the truth and more. I feel like the spider in the center. Anonymous, 1963.
Okay, maybe we could um, skip to the next one. Uh, sorry, Piali, just a moment. I'm trying yeah, yeah. to, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. This piece is called The Nest. We go to the next one. Okay, maybe the next one. This piece is called the dinner plate. Okay, yeah, maybe if I could get a reader for this, that'd be great. Would somebody like to volunteer to read this piece? I'll read this one. <clears throat> a beating heart, a poem about miscarriage, a bleeding vulva episode, 4 a.m. bird baths and tiny pools of rejected childbirth. This child was created a ghost, only to be seen in dreams and spiraling, spiraling down toilet rings. I held baby so fragilely, day after day, wiping her from my blood-stained labia and thighs. I think she may have had her father's eyes, a perfectly functioning body, just a reflection of unborn lies, hips too narrow to bear life. I heard your heart beat, laying my head to rest on your daddy's strong chest and cried long dead before you were due to be alive. Wish I could have met you, said I love you and goodbye. No, I can't wait to hold you in the spirit life. Anonymous participant, birth year 1991. Thank you. This is called a Venus fly trap. Let me go to the next one. Okay, maybe the next one. Um, yeah, I'd love to get a volunteer to read this out. I can read it if nobody else is volunteering. Okay, so the cyborg. I was born as a male. I have always identified as a woman. I have always identified my soul as deeply female. After my surgery, I began blogging about my transition and my vulva vagina has been a source of livelihood through sharing my experience and helping other people who are going through the same thing. I've had shame around my identity from the time I could first remember. I have shame around being born a male. I've had shame since I transitioned. I have experienced shame from male lovers who know I am trans. I once had a lover and we fell in love, but he never wanted to look at my vulva with the lights on. I want to liberate myself and truly love this vulva that I work so deeply to build. It makes me feel complete, alive, and like me. Anonymous, birth year 1991. Thank you, Tejal. Kelly, can I move to the next slide? Yes. Yeah, maybe we could just move along for the next couple of ones. Yeah, and if you could just stop over here for a second. So I consolidated some of my pieces. Of course, there are a lot more. Um, and just as a way to really show, you know, the work that 
I've done the, and as you can see, a lot of these individuals come from different backgrounds, different experiences. We all share the same experience. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this process was extremely healing for me um, to, you know, from, like I mentioned earlier, from moving from a survivor or sorry, a, to, from a victim to a survivor and just really trying to bring touch individuals. And I thought I was beautifying their body while I was healing from within and the connection and the conversations, their stories are so important. The picture is one thing, but the stories are so much bigger. So it's really my, um, my intention to create a stage a space where people speak about safety, consent, share experiences, and really try to realize that they're not isolated in that experience. Um, so I want this all to really be a co-creation rather than me creating the art and um, showing it and displaying it. Another thing I wanted to share is that um, I'll be showing this work in to the, the Goethe Institute hopefully this year or the next. And one thing that came into our conversation was selling the art or making money off of it. And what I really came to decide through working in the anti-trafficking field for this project specifically, I'd want all the money to go into either the Rape Crisis Center um, or some organization that continues to do the important work of empowering individuals because um, for me to sell this work would be in a way like trafficking <laughs> or selling these individuals who really trusted me. So there's just been a lot of realizations, a lot of growth for me personally, and I really want to share that. Okay, I think we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share a collage of some of the other work I've done through body painting. Um, I worked on this, this um, a series called Mythical Creatures, um, painting the human canvas as a way to really explore um, different emotions such as curiosity, sadness, melancholy, um, grief, loss, um, and just to, it was really amazing to work with the contours of different humans instead of using paper or canvas or a wall to understand what this could really um, transform into. Okay, um, so yeah, within this uh, gender-based discrimination field or realm, um, I, I happened to travel to India in 2012. Um, and the, the trip was primarily to spend time with family. And at that point, um, the New Delhi rape case um, occurred, if you know, if some of you may remember it. So I decided to actually stop traveling, stay in Calcutta, and this mural was a part of a silent protest to stand up for um, this young girl and her family, as well as all the other children and girls and women at risk of, of rape. And um, I feel like in a lot of ways, they, they, there wasn't much support at the time. I'm really hopeful that there is change in the works. But just to explain a little bit about this mural, which is still up in Calcutta. <laughs> um, so all the girls in this mandala are the girls who I worked with in a rescue home. So they were survivors of sex trafficking from different states of India, from Nepal. And um, so, yeah, I painted their portraits with a fellow artist from New York. And then the main face right in the center um, is supposed to be Nirbhaya, the girl who, um, who was raped in this, in this event. And it, the mural is supposed to show how all of our faces, we all are a part of one. We exist in her, Nirbhaya, and she exists in us. So it, it, the, the painting was amazing, but I just want to share that the interaction with the local people and the passerby, I wish I could have recorded it. I heard so many various things from like support, wanting to 
pour in money for Nirbhaya, her family, the girls that I work with, as well as people who weren't that supportive. And we're really feeding these various core wheels of like the rape culture in the world. It's not just in India. So yeah, this mural was a great just study for me, a field study. We can go to the next one. Okay, so this is um, a project that I haven't really showed very much. It's called the Hands Project. Um, so here, what I did was I went into Sonar Gachi, which is the second largest notorious red light district in all of Asia. It is in Calcutta. And I worked with young girls, girls who were rescued, as well as women and girls or female identifying folks. Um, that were sex workers and were born into brothels. So what I did was I collected their handprints and I, I pasted, wheat pasted these hands all over the city just to show that these were the hands of our girls, our, our children, of people who were either forced into sex work, most of the time they were. And um, yeah, so for people to touch them or to hold them or to look at them, because this really gives an idea of who these people are. So um, the, the picture to the left is a young girl named Sonal. She's eight years old and she was actually preparing for her first client. She was very excited and her skin was buttered with oil every day. And she has no idea what's happening, but she knew that she was supposed to be excited. Only eight. And then the woman to the right is um, somebody who was born into a brothel. And um, she too, uh, she, she wanted to be in the picture. She also wanted to hide her face. But what you aren't seeing is the left side of her face where she had a massive cut from her lip to her ear very early on in, um, her career. Okay, so um, this project is called what I called it um, when the revolution came. And the reason why I named it that was because um, there was a song that was called when the revolution comes. And the truth is it did, it did come in the US and um, yeah, I just want to speak a little bit to this project. Um, this project really was started brewing about 10 years ago when a lot of the police brutalities against African American and Black people were coming into light. I mean, it's always been there, but it was being recorded, I guess, which was, um, you know, shocking to a lot of people, which is something that maybe wasn't happening before it was, but it wasn't you know, surfacing the way it was at, at the time. So for me as an American, as a woman, as a South Asian woman, I realized that I had not enough or very little knowledge about black history, which is such a core, I mean, it is the core of American history. So my project really began as a way to not only uplift African-American and black voices, and stories, but to really create awareness and educate myself and others, my family, my community about Black lives and why no lives matter until Black lives matter. So I was really humbled to hear about, to really learn and educate myself through watching documentaries, reading books, watching YouTube videos about how people so rich in culture had been um, through so much and yet they were so resilient and also for how long their voices were muted. And it really took, you know, so many lives to be lost or even a pandemic for people to really come to realize that they need to educate themselves. So really through my artwork, I really wanted to reach as many people as possible. Um, I participated in some protests, but I also realized for me, I really had to think about where I could have the most impact. And for me, it was really the people around me, which is my family and breaking this entire perspective of, of racism, bigotry, which existed 
you know, within me, within my family, towards like other Indians. I mean, it's just very, very complicated issue. But specifically, um, you know, I really wanted to share my education in Black history, U.S. history, with um, uh, my community. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so these are some women I um, drew. And we can go to the next slide, which may include their stories. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, can I have a volunteer to read this out? I can go again if somebody else isn't. Okay. Harriet Tubman, March 1822 to March 10, 1913. As a conductor on the Underground Railroad, Harriet Tubman made several trips into slave holding states, leading dozens of individuals to freedom in the North. During the Civil War, she further risked her life and safety to work first as a nurse and then as a spy for the Union Army. Afterwards, she became an outspoken advocate for African American and women's rights insisting that all be afforded dignity, treated with respect, and granted equality. Thank you. So we can move on, yeah. Can I invite another volunteer? I'll, I'll read. Uh, George Stinney Jr. 1929 to 1944. George Stinney Jr. was an African-American boy who at the age of 14 was convicted in a proceeding later vacated as an unfair trial in 2014 of murdering two white girls, Betty June Binnaker, aged 11, and Mary Emma Thames, aged seven, in his hometown of Alcolu, South Carolina. He was executed by electric chair in June 1944, thus becoming the youngest American with an exact birth date, confirmed to be sentenced to death and executed in the 20th century. As was typical at the time, Stenny was tried before an all-white jury. In 1944, most African Americans in the South were prohibited from voting and therefore in ineligible to serve on juries. After deliberating for fewer than 10 minutes, the jury found Stenny guilty of both murders. Thank you, Wayne. Can I invite someone to read this? I can. John Lewis. John Robert Lewis was an American politician, statesman, and civil rights activist and leader who served in the United States House of Representatives for Georgia's 5th Congressional District from 1987 until his death in 2020. He was the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee from 1963 to 1966. And then I guess this is a quote, too many of us still believe our differences define us. Thank you so much, Eve. Okay. I'm happy to read the next one. Sure. Rosa Parks, 1913 to 2005. Rosa Louise Macaulay Parks was an African-American civil rights activist who in 1955 famously refused to give up her bus seat, launching the influential Montgomery Bus Boycott. Parks began her career as an activist in the early 1930s. She served as secretary in the Montgomery Division of NAACP for 14 years from 43 to 57, during which she played a key role in mobilizing support for the rape victim, Ressie Tyler, and bringing the incident to national notice. After the Montgomery bus boycott, Rosa Parks became an international icon of resistance to racial segregation. She has been called by the US Congress as the first lady of civil rights and the mother of the freedom movement. 
Rosa Parks received many awards and honors during her life, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the Congressional Gold Medal. Thank you. Um, so this is the last slide from this project, but so maybe I can read it. Martin Luther King Jr., who doesn't need much of an introduction, 1929 to 1968. Martin Luther King is famous for leading the American civil rights movement and fighting against discrimination of African Americans in the US. Here are, ten, oh, well, I didn't include the 10 prominent accomplishments, which, I think it was a part of the animation, but it doesn't show up here. I'm sorry. Well, he's done a lot of great things and um, I highly recommend watching Selma, which is a movie that I watched with my family during the pandemic. And for us, it was really incredible to see how um, MLK as well as John Lewis really came, they really tried harn harnessing um, love in their activism, which was very inspiring to, to, to all of us. Thank you. Okay, so I, <clears throat> this is uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat. He's an artist that um, really inspired me. He's from New York City and um, he actually uh, used to do graffiti and his uh, street name was Samo. And um, I love that this quote that he used, life is confusing at this point. And this will be a little bit relevant in the later slides. So yeah, we can just move on. Um, yeah, just for the sake of time, I'm just gonna try to wrap this up really quick so we can take some questions. But um, yeah, through this process, and especially last year in 2020, I've been living in a Tibetan Buddhist monastery or the compounds of it. and. I've started um, drawing some of my teachers, some of the monks that I interact with to really share their story of how either they left Tibet or they've never been there because they can't. And um, really been, I've been interviewing them on how, you know, how they've reconciled with being a nationless people and um, how they have really try to cultivate forgiveness. So yeah, there's more stories that will be coming in. We'll keep you all posted. Um, and so, yeah, as we look through, um, you know, the projects that I shared, I feel like a lot of the um, issues that I really immerse myself in is, um, you know, anti-rape work, gender-based discrimination, um, uh, climate change and the environmental issues that are tied along with it. So these are two pieces that I've done. The one to the right is actually on the uh, levee in the lower ninth ward in New Orleans. What I didn't share here is that it's just a few pieces away from the a Banksy piece, which I really wanted to um, get my work near Banksy's work. Uh, of course, his work overshadows mine. But yeah, this heart, it's a beating heart filled with a storm and all the valves are bursting. And this really goes to show that it's not the hurricane that really caused the devastation in New Orleans, but it's the levee that wasn't fixed. And it's a very political and bureaucratic issue. Um, and then the piece to the left was inspired by everybody who protested in Standing Rock in um, North Dakota, as well as, you know, other activists like Greta Thunberg. And it really, you know, the, the hourglass shows that our time is running out. If we don't change our behavior and the way we relate to our earth and the way we choose to live, um, we're gonna move from the upper part of the hourglass, which is nature, beauty, living things down to like a very smoky, arid, earth cracked, you know, factory living. Um, yeah, so we can move on. Yeah, so I just yeah, wanted to- Sorry, my internet is a bit unstable. Oh, it's okay. Um, thank you, Tejal. So yeah, this is the last piece I wanted to share. And it's a 
piece that I worked on with Basquiat's inspiration. So you can see him down there on the bottom. And then the little head on top is my daughter, Kaya. So over the last four years of her life, she's only four, um, we just collected all of her artwork in this plastic bag. And I decided that it needs to be a wall of art. So this piece is pretty massive. And um, I introduced her to Jean-Michel Basquiat and she likes his work. I mean, she doesn't have much of an opinion. She thinks it's cool, um, but yeah, she likes it. She thinks that she relates to him and he draws a lot more like her than her mommy does. So yeah, I created this piece. Um, I make art with my kid. I think it's great. I, I, I really encourage her to draw out of the line, within the line, over the line, everywhere. So yeah. Once again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Tejal. Thank you for your participation and reading and just being a part of this. And lastly, I just want to most importantly also like, you know, showing the work is great, but I want to thank every single person who has trusted me enough to paint them. And I feel like art is a constant co-creation. So thank you all for being a part of this. And I want to learn and grow and you're all a part of it. Thank you so much, Piali, for this amazing uh, presentation of your artistic practice of your activist work, of your journey with dharma, uh, of your life. You're um, so really grateful, uh, very grateful. And now we open the floor for questions. So please, if anybody has any questions, you can either raise your digital hand or your physical hand or unmute yourself. So there um, are a few comments in our chat box. Yeah, please go ahead, Wayne. Sorry. I just, I just am uh, knowing a little bit about Piali's life. I, I'm just amazed. Like, do you ever sleep? <laughs> um, I, I, you must have a, I wonder, do you like, do you, is there a time of day when you most like to do your art or is it, do you just do it when you have, a couple hour break or something. Thank you, Wayne. It's really wonderful to see you here. Um, you know, I think the truth is being a parent, it's, you know, I'm really committed to my child. So I think in most recent times, it's really an integration between my art and making art with her. So um, my art definitely looks a lot different, but it's very fulfilling and it really just makes me feel so flexible to, to deal with something like, like that. You know, it's very free flowing, a lot of glue, a lot of messiness. But um, yeah, I really draw my inspiration from connecting with others. So it really comes very sporadically and especially in the last year. Um, yeah, it's... it's uh, I, I do sleep, so the answer is yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I should be making more art. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Thrifty? Thrifty, go ahead. Really, I'm overwhelmed with what I've seen. And um, I think the key one, key, um, all your work is so phenomenal and needs much more time for me to absorb it. But the first part was striking because you would have built a relationship of trust for people to literally open their most vulnerable part of them to you. And I wonder what it takes uh, to do something like that because it's more than, it's. It's, it's more than going to a doctor and talking about what they are and who they are. And I know you said you were healing, but I cannot even imagine what they were going through. What was, you know, so I'd love to hear a bit about that. I'm sure that's a much longer conversation though. 
Thank you, Tripti. That was an incredible question. And, and thank you for your words. You know, I think <clears throat> um, I, I got a lot of participants from um, friends who recommended. Um, so I, I don't ever feel like it was me reaching out to different folks and, and them trusting me. I think this kind of this level of trust comes from, um, you know, people vouching because it's so intimate, it's so private. And actually after I painted about 20 uh, individuals, um, a friend recommended, they, they told me, you know, you should, you should get painted. And I'm like, that is so true. So I did, and I was very ashamed, I was shy. I felt like I wasn't ready. Who gets ready? Um, so I, I got painted and it was very, I was scared. I was, my knees kept coming together. I mean, you know, it's, uh, and I kept, you know, my, my friend, I kept talking about things that were really important to me in this, you know, for instance, growing up in India, the room with the altar oh can you hear me now okay um the room with the altar if I was on my period and yet you know the shivalingam stood very brave and strong which is the male phallic so there was a lot for me to learn and really break through that so it really helped to talk about um like just really run my train of thought openly and freely to understand how I viewed my body, what I didn't like about my upbringing and feeling shame around my bleeding. And I've, you know, I, it was very liberating. Today I can say things like the word vagina out loud without feeling shame. But I remember in the beginning, I was very subdued about it or, or speaking about, you know, my, my, um, the shame I have felt or, you know, hair, hair is such a big thing. I remember a very long time ago, I was introduced to some like wash to cover the smell of that area. The, men don't get to do those things. There's no birth control made for them. It's so there's a lot of different things. So I, I feel like the trust built, I mean, I had to experience it myself to understand who I was trusting for how long I was going to be like that. At some point I surrendered, but it was really me overcoming a lot of my own fears of myself and not really a perpetrator coming in again. Yeah. It's amazing, Piali. I want my daughter to see this. I really I do. I hope you can share it with her. I'm so happy to share it share the link. Thank you so much. This means a lot. Yes, Eve or Ev, please go ahead. Well, thank you so much, Piali, for sharing all of this beautiful artwork. It's, it's so touching and it's so nice to see the wide array of what you're doing. I guess I have a question which has to, like, how do you, um, how do you keep yourself sane and how do you not fall into like so much sadness when you're, you know, talking to some of these people and hearing their stories? Like I was especially um, concerned about those two young girls in the brothel that were born into that brothel and their handprints. And I would just feel like I couldn't go on after that, seeing that, you know, and, and so much of this work touches on things that are so, devastating to the heart. So how do you keep your heart protected? Thank you, Eve. That's a great question. So the answer to that is for a long time, I wasn't that sane. <laughs> um, no, I wouldn't say that. But um, I, I think that I was very immersed in it. And that's what really triggered my, um, my autoimmune flare up. I was constantly sick, my uterus hurt, I formed cysts. Um, I didn't have a separation between what was happening in the brothels and um, what was happening in my home. It was very enmeshed in one another. There was, I remember telling Tejal when we first discussed having this talk that there's nothing 
there was is nothing not radical about me. I really, um, it was, it was, it was really hard. It was really hard. And I think one thing that I learned, and this is where the intersection with dharma comes into place, like my Buddhist practice, which has really brought things down a lot. It's, I think using skillful means is really important because if you don't do that, you may think that you're trying to benefit others, but actually you're not. You're not taking care of yourself, not the people around you. And this really shows up in so many different ways. The pain, the, the built-in trauma that you might be perpetuating. So I think for me, it really, it was a time for me to actually step back and like learn to understand what was happening in my body, my uterus, and really with all of these experiences, I think it's also acknowledgement of privilege. Like my daughter is safe. She's not in Sonargachi. What can I do with that? How can I benefit those girls still in, in the brothel? It's also bringing up a young female identifying child at least for now, um, you know, and just like, you know, talking to her about gender, talking to her about safety. Um, I was talking to a couple of other mothers who have children or actually parents who have children about how they talk about their uh, private parts to, to their child or introduce that. And to me, that's really important. I tried not to focus it as much as on safety, which is obviously very important, but it also implies that there may be danger but also to speak about it as being something sacred, something that they don't have to scrub and clean. I mean, there's just so many different things that people are taught about this part because it's such a secret for so long. Um, so yeah, I think that there's little ways of how I, I choose to part, you know, still contribute. And also, you know, Eve, I think that for a long time, I was very hurt, I was very upset. And um, yeah, the Buddha Dharma meditating on impermanence. And I, I don't mean actually, that all just sounds very spiritual bypassy, but um, this is very real. And there's various ways that we can create awareness and also benefit others constantly. And then also with the hands project, one thing I, I failed to mention was that um, when I connected with them and heard their stories, I noticed that me telling them how they should be being an Indian living in the States was not helpful, not beneficial. What was really helpful was for me to be consistent to visit every time I went to India and to relate with them on just anything whether it was painting or drawing or hearing about the newest toy that they got, any of those things. Um, and what was inspiring for them, which is like a seed of like what life could be if they chose, was for a strong or, you know, what they viewed as strong person, a woman to come to India that was doing what she really wanted and brave enough to walk through Sonargachi. I mean, maybe that's the way they view, viewed me. I hope maybe, but um, yeah, I think connection, connection is so key to everything. Yeah. Yes, Aziz G, please go ahead. <laughs> Eve, good evening and good morning to you. Some of you thought the PLE is sin. How do you keep yourself sin? No, I must tell you from my experience, to be a creative person, disruptively creative, you've got to be insane. you got to be insane in the normal sense. Now, Pierre will disagree with me, what is normal, what is standard, but really it is what Pierre has done is a disruptive creativity in an area, normal sane person, will not be able to see. Naturally, in a normal standard, she is insane. But definitely, I, as a creative person in innovation in science, I look at it really purely as a dis disruption. 
in creativity, disruptive creativity, that is above breakthrough. Breakthrough innovation and disruptive innovation. That is super. I am very proud of you as a father. Okay, good job. Keep it up. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, we are so happy, Piali, that so many of your family members are here and it's very good to hear from them. So thank you also for joining. May I please just read a few comments from the chat box and then we can take some more live questions. So Maria had to leave early, but she said, Piali, I'm so inspired and amazed by your work and by you. Thank you for sharing so generously. And then Shene has said, wonderful Piali. Indiraji is saying, proud of you and your wonderful and brave presentation. Love you. And Tone has said, thank you for this journey. Beautiful. And with a wow. So thank you everyone for, and Eve also said, you're so talented. Your art is poignant. So, yeah. And please, if anybody would like to ask any more questions, share your comments, your feelings, impressions, please. This is a very good opportunity. I want to say, Piali, that uh, even your portraits of when the revolution came of uh, African American. Um, uh, what should we say, like uh, torchbearers, you know, at the at the uh, the civil rights activists, they are very beautiful portraits. Um, and I, what I really enjoy is that whether it was the initial piece, the sacred labyrinth, or this, there's a very intimate connection, as if you form with whoever you are working with, and that's very evident in the work. So even though this time you're not painting bodies. But I could really feel that you try to enter into the whole history and the feelings of the person. And I think this is a very important conversation to be had on how, what kind of racism exists within the South Asian community and how to address that. So it was also very beautiful to have this uh, quote, you know, that we think we're different. But I mean, I, I can't remember the exact quote, but so thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tejal. And uh, Wayne has also sent a comment saying very powerful artistic and political statements, Piali. Sena is saying thank you for your inspiring work. And Indira Ji is saying superb job and the spirit of freedom from Piali is from Piali is grandfather? So no, I don't know. it's my grandfather. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Um, you know, I think a, a, a part of uh, drawing those portraits, I'm not a portrait artist at all, but um, I watched, I think I've drawn about 40 to 50 individuals um, even some people in this room here. And um, I, I think that one thing that's amazing is, well, one thing that was good for me was to watch documentaries or listen to podcasts or audiobooks while drawing these individuals. And I really felt close to the person while I was drawing their features and their eyes and painting it in. It was really impactful for me. I felt very close to these people. Um, yeah, thank you. Please, if you will allow me to share uh, just a very small personal uh, story of how I met Piali, is that this portrait you see on the left is of Venerable Geshe Dorji Damdo, and uh, he is our common teacher. And we, I met Piali for the first time at a retreat in Deer Park, Himachal Pradesh, which our teacher was giving Geshala. And uh, that's where we connected and Piali told me about her art. I also have a background in art and I'm very grateful that over the years, uh, we have had the chance to revive our connection and this 
um, presentation has come about. I think it's very important to have uh, voices and intersectionalities that Yali represents uh, be shared with more people. So thank you everyone for taking your time and joining us yet again for this Sisters in Spirit event. Thank you, Piali. And, uh, you know, maybe we can dedicate the merits. Uh, Piali, would you like to please lead that? Um, it's a little loud here with breakfast time. So could you? Sure, 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 sure. So uh, dedication of merit is uh, one important practice that we know from the Kadampa teachers. It's to make sure that whatever wholesome and virtuous energy we have accrued by coming here together is in the future across lifetimes always channeled towards our highest, uh, deepest uh, uh, aspirations, uh, whatever they might be. And uh, the deepest aspiration perhaps that we all share is of our happiness and uh, that we always need good causes and conditions and may all the other sentient beings also need with very wholesome causes and conditions so that there can be more understanding, more peace and more focus on what joins us rather than what separates us. And um, May we all meet with great enlightened teachers who help us uh, on that journey. And uh, thank you so much. I wish you all a very good rest of the weekend. Thank you, Piali, so much for taking this time and sharing with us. Okay. Thank you, Piali and Tejal. Continued fabulous lineup always. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. We'll Bye. send you a follow-up email with Kiali's presentation and also a link to this video recording so okay. you can share with your friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.